Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Mac Flash Five, the show where we like to list our top five favorite movies fitting a certain genre or topic. My name is Matt. I am here with Bardog Despin, and we are here with AB. And it, it's no secret we are talking westerns today. How are you guys doing? Great bite. Awesome. How are you guys? Good to see you guys. Good, good, good. It. I mean, yes. It. To us, we're excited to be here again because we haven't recorded in a while. We record a lot and then uh, post them up. So even though it's been, I think, just a few weeks since our last video, we recorded that video months ago. I know. Mm. Took so, the last little bit of summer off, so it's nice yeah. to get back into it with you guys. Partners, so. with you partners. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So since today we're talking Westerns, I think it's fair to tell everyone uh, watching to put your five favorite Westerns in the comments now because there are seven trillion Western films. I watched a lot of them. Yeah. And there's a, a good chance that your five films on your list aren't even on ours. In fact, I'm going to bet they're mostly no, mostly not. As far as top five are concerned, yeah, I mean, we're going to yeah. list we're going to list our top five yeah. favorite favorite westerns, not you know uh, well, we, critically we, acclaimed or yeah, yeah. or box office uh, uh, bonzo huge movies. These are our five favorite. Um, so if we just want to start in, I'll let it remind everybody how the show works. After we decide on a topic, <clears throat> Westerns being that one, we go our separate ways and we compose our top five films. Uh, three of those films we will talk about in depth and two honorable mentions will be honorably mentioned. AB picked this topic. He gets to start off. All right. Um, yeah, I, I definitely picked the westerns because westerns uh, are definitely some of my favorites. Um, I come by it honestly because my grandfather uh, was a western aficionado. Um, when you would go to their house, my grandparents' house, they're in their uh, coat uh, closet in the front of the house. Uh, they would have all obviously all the coats, but then there was a stack about higher than me. Uh, of VHS tapes of tape stuff that was taped off of TV, and so um, the way VHS works for people, young people that don't know how to VHS work, uh, it ta you could tape stuff off TV, but uh, on the VHS tape, uh, you could put it depending on the quality, you could put an SP quality, which would allow you for two hours, and if you could put uh, EP quality, and that would be extended play. Uh, would be a full six hours, and my grandpa would record everything in EP, so it's six hours worth of westerns uh, on every single tape. And so uh, he had mountains of things. So I watched a ton uh, at his house, uh, and he had he loved uh, Gunsmoke and Bonanza and all those shows too. So he had tapes and tapes of those. So I, I have seen, I, I saw all the classics very early on. My grandpa was a uh, very much a traditionalist, and some of the ones that are on my list would make him uh, cry, probably, if he is still alive. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, because they are not uh, the traditional questions, but I did include some, um, and he will be happy about those uh, if he's watching from wherever, uh, from heaven. And, and so... Um, I'm going to start off with one you definitely will not <laughs> approve of. Uh, and it was my token one. I I wanted to put some other great ones on, but I was like, okay, I got to throw a token horror movie on because that's what I do on this show uh, constantly. And so um, I, this is also my uh, most modern uh, one. It came out in 2015. Bone Tomahawk uh, from 2015, directed by S. Craig Zeller. Uh, starring my man Kurt Russell uh, in an amazing performance, also starring uh, Patrick Wilson, Matthew Fox, uh, and Richard Jenkins, and it also uh, has uh, Lily Tom uh, Lily Simmons in it as well, um, and there's some cameos by small roles by Sid Haig and David Arquette. 
Um, and it's the cast is unbelievable. Um, I also picked this one for you, Scott, because Matthew Fox is in it, and Matthew Smiley, Fox yeah. is is in what was probably his most Scott uh loving role in in this movie because he plays a cocky bastard i love matt um, fox's movie i thought this i thought this would have been your number one i know how much you love this movie so i'm i'm really excited to see what your two and oh, one you've are seen, you've seen that. this you saw yeah. this one yeah. oh wow matt have you seen this no i've heard okay. i've heard it mentioned quite a lot though okay so it was on a ton uh, it was sorry to, i know you're gonna go i remember when it came out 2015 it yep. was on a ton a ton of year-end reviews hi it yep. was like because i was listening to podcasts a lot then it was always on everybody's top five of the year yeah, yeah. so Violent. Uh, Violent. Uh, yeah it, okay so it, that's the thing is that when you look at it and, and, it, and it is on my list because it's a horror movie but uh three quarters of this movie are not a horror movie if you watch the first three quarters of this movie it is basically a traditional Western. And so uh, the horror comes in the last, I'd say, 20 to 30 minutes uh, when they finally track down uh, who took uh, Lily Simmons. Uh, so it, I, I kind of glossed over, but uh, Kurt Russell plays the sheriff of this small town. Uh, this stranger comes into town. You need to see what happened at the beginning, but I won't give that away. Uh, and he comes into town and... Um, something follows him in kills a bunch of people and then takes lily simmons and then another dude and take off and so um patrick wilson is lily simmons wife or husband and he has a broken leg and he wants to go out after uh his wife and Jen get her back and so uh kurt russell richard jenkins who's an old old deputy and hilarious in this um and patrick wilson and matthew fox ride out to try and get uh, Lily Simmons back. And so when they finally catch up to what uh, did capture Lily Simmons, uh, that's when the horror takes over and it is um, got a scene in there, which is um, now very much infamous scene, uh, which uh, is, it is something I've never seen before on film and probably never will again. It is, um, one that I have, I've so, so I've shown this movie to uh, probably a handful of people, and every time it comes up to that scene, I literally watch the person watching that scene. And I actually, I actually got my buddy Will to film himself watching that scene. I said, okay, once it gets to the the cave, uh, start recording yourself watching the movie, and he's like, "What? Why?" And so he sent me the video, and it was amazing. Like it, I couldn't have asked for a better reaction that he gave uh, for that scene. It is uh, unbelievable. Uh, Which we'll it, play it, now. No, yeah, <laughs> we we will not. We will not because we will lose viewers. In, in the no, first I want to see your. I want to see your buddy's reaction. Oh, I, <laughs> I wish I. I wish I had it. I, I, I'd have to track it down. But anyway, it's it's hilarious uh, that reaction to it. But that scene is absolutely unbelievable um, and just awful uh, to watch. But uh, it, it's this movie. I will. I will. Won't just. Uh, please do not. Uh, let that stop you from watching it because it is a great film. Uh, just once they get to the cave, kind of be ready to close your eyes because it's <laughs> it's pretty gruesome. Well, if I close my eyes, how am I supposed to send you my reaction video? Oh, well, you can watch it. I'm saying people <laughs> with queasy stomachs. Oh, I see. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, Bone Tomahawk, uh, I will say, uh, like, it, it has got some incredible writing in it the dialogue like i said the first three quarters of it is a traditional wrestling of them kind of riding along and a lot of them especially you know matthew fox and and uh kurt russell are kind of the alphas and they kind of go head to head and so and there's you know tension between patrick wilson and matthew fox because of an old um uh, matthew fox is an old flame so there's tensions there and and it just like kind of like jaws by the end of it they you know there's a you know a bond that's built between the four men which is um just in incredible and they're like i said there's i won't ruin there's a couple a couple of lines in there actually i will ruin one no i won't i won't, won't ruin one but <laughs> matthew fox has one and, and it is it is a scott line for sure uh we'll talk about it after but uh it, it was just as soon as it came up uh when i did the rewatch i'm like oh i'm sure scott would love that right there it was amazing but then kurt russell has uh, an all-time uh, memorable line for me at the end, and I can't use it because it will give away 
a big spoiler at the end of the movie. Uh, <laughs> but it, you'll know it when you hear it. It is a beautiful line. It is an absolute beautiful line that actually got me emotional uh, because how good it was and how like powerful it was. So, um, yes, uh, my number three is Bone Tomahawk from 2015. You know, the funny thing about this movie, that movie came out, I just looked at the release dates. It was October 2015, and Hateful Eight was December 2015. Yeah. And Kurt so Russell's in both, obviously. Kurt and so he, he jumped all over this. Set. He he literally jumped all over this and hatefully because he had wanted to be in a Western. He had never been in a Western before. He wanted to be in a Western so badly. So he signed on. Uh, I mean, he sent Tombstone. Uh, right. But he's like, <laughs> yeah, I was like, he wanted, like, uh, I'm saying, like, since Tombstone, yeah. he had never uh, been. No, it's interesting. And it's just a testament. But yeah, I remember. And I remember thinking, and even the legacy is it's largely forgotten because Hateful Eight, obviously, Quentin Tarantino is his own atmosphere. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like. You know, well, it's, this it's is the indie, other it's western indie, that Kurt did that year, that which most it, people didn't even see. It was a, it was a completely indie film too. Yeah. This uh, Bon Tomac was a completely independent film. It actually was released unrated uh, because of that, because it got no distribution from a, a thing, and it actually did fairly well. And especially once word of mouth got out, uh, like you said, all the top ten lists, uh, and it it exploded. And so, and Craig, us Craig Zeller went on to make you know a, a couple of other films that you know are pretty pretty crazy as well with mel gibson and uh vince vaughn is in the other uh, is in yeah. both of his other two but uh yeah i mean it's it's done well it's done well for an in, uh, independent like self basically self-financed movie uh which he wrote and directed it's pretty amazing okay my number three is on the complete opposite side <laughs> of <laughs> of the, the universe uh, of the universe for sure <laughs> yes and similar to uh ab's his is a western and a horror film mine is a western and something else it's actually the first western i have ever seen yeah it's got picked an american up. tale fifo goes west i called this one yeah, yeah. <laughs> i called it would be your two but i i did i am one for one so far yeah it Please was, continue. as I was compiling the list, it was number two. And then I rewatched it. And it's go a good movie, but compared to the other ones on my list, it's definitely three. And it's a lesser than film, even compared to its own uh, original film in uh, the original American Tale. So an American Tale, Fifle Goes West, is a sequel to an American Tale. They've spent time in New York and they hate it. So after some cats drive them away from their neighborhood, uh, they find uh, they find uh, a rally going on where uh, uh, it's a cat holding a marionette mouse, and the cat is voiced by uh, John Cleese, who is saying, "Come out west to uh, Green River, where cats and mice live together." They hop <laughs> on a train, they head out west. Fifle falls on the train, falls off the train, and then we. We think we're going to get uh, back to the, like the original story where he's lost for the whole time, and then at the end he finds his family. He finds his family pretty quick, and uh, he discovers the cat's plan to turn the mice village people into mouse burgers, <laughs> and he, he does his best to warn the village, the uh, the town. He tries to gain the help of uh, the town uh, lawman or law dog Wiley Burp voiced by Jimmy Stewart in what I think is his final film role. Oh, no, that might be. Wow. Yep. Um, Dom, De Dom DeLuise returns as Tiger the Cat, and between the three of them, they are going to bring uh, law and justice and right back to the, gra the, the town of Green River and shoo away the cats. American Tale, Fifle Goes West is my number three. Great. I knew you'd love it. I knew that you would be on your list. I have not seen this movie in 30 years. I remember I'm, being into it for a hot minute. And then I think I jumped off it for a great mouse detective and then subsequently yeah. through. But I remember early 90s being for a very hot minute into Five Goes West. So I, I, when you're describing that, I was like, <laughs> you know what? I don't, I thought that I'd seen it, but then you're describing it. I'm like, I don't know if I've seen this movie. I, I, I a hundred percent have seen American tale before and no doubt, yeah. but I was like, 
none of this is clicking for me at all <laughs> and so like i actually do not think that i've we'll seen do a viewing Bible party well. yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm it's definitely on gotta watch it now i watched on it on Disney crave Plus. today oh crave, crave. Oh, okay yeah. cool interesting all right okay step into the saloon guys so <laughs> uh guys i have never we've been off for a few weeks as we said so i had the chance to do lots and lots of westerns and Sadly, subsequently, I came around. I, I've seen a lot of modern westerns. There's been kind of an uptick, whether you of of the modern western in the last, you know, 10, 15 years, um, mainstream and in television and things like that. It's getting a little bit of a renaissance. And I didn't want my list to be too poppy and too like modern. So I went back and I revisited a ton. I have watched, no lie, probably 25 to 30 westerns in the last like six weeks. Uh, I watched two more today, didn't make my list. I watched I had never seen some John Wayne. I watched about three John Wayne films. I watched some early Clint, things like that. So this is a movie, and my number three, that I knew about. I watched as a kid, kind of forgot about it. think I thought it was a little overrated. I watched it again at the start of my rewatch. Thought it was good. think I was on my phone a little bit. I didn't really let it time to marinate. I did a ton of Western podcasts in the last little bit, getting rankings, getting ones to go. And this always came up number one. And I'm like, what am I missing? So I went back, I put my phone away. I watched it again recently. And I did a four hour breakdown podcast, broken two parts by cinephiles, two hours each part. My number three that I came back to is 1992's Unforgiven. So Unforgiven is always at the list of some of the best Westerns ever made. What I like about it, it's kind of a deconstruction to the idea of the Western. Mm -hmm. I watched a lot of old Clint. I watched High Plains Drifter and The Outlaw Josie Wales. Josie Wales almost made my list. That's a really fun movie. That's right. like an, a very early John Wick kind of. But in this, Clint brings everything back together on a script he held on for about 16 years. He bought it in the late 70s. So this was written as a Western's taxi driver of like black and white there's no black and white it's just gray everyone is shades of gray and there are no good characters in this film watching it back with a more critical eye and watching mainly for the performances of clint and gene hackman all online they have gene hackman as one of the greatest villains in movie history little bill is not a villain he is yeah. incredible in this film and i agree with him through the whole film he's a lawman in a lawless time so he has to be the way he is. Now, granted, he buys in a little bit to arrogance as well when, when he gets um, English Bob, Richard Harris, uh, when he kicks his ass and kind of takes his, uh, uh, takes his like biographer and starts hamming up a bit. But for the most part, Clint Eastwood, Morgan Freeman, and the Schofield Kid, uh, Schofield Kid whose name is escaping me at this time, uh, James Wolvert, in his first debut, he subsequently retired from Hollywood. They play three uh, three cowboys that go to avenge and get a uh, uh, payment for two men roughing up and cutting prostitutes. So they get the bounty, and that's what they want to do. So Gene Hackman is is the sheriff of Big Whiskey, and it's his job to protect his people, and and that's what he's going to do because these these prostitutes put a bounty on these two men, and they didn't mean anything wrong. And it was just a, a bad mistake. And he's going to protect his town. And Clint Eastwood is the most meanest, baddest outlaw there's ever been, which again is a great send up to his character and his history in the seventies. A lot of that will come up earlier, later. And as he, uh, as he goes, he's kind of softened a bit. He's older. He got married and he lost his, his wife, but everyone talks about how mean and nasty he was in his youth. And there's a lot of, morality on all the characters on you know what's true what's not can you be the past how do you change how do you grow and then ultimately once it clicks in the third act and the catalyst for clint snapping back into his previous self it's electric the third act of this film is unbelievable so uh you know it won the best uh best picture uh best director uh editing and the supporting oscar for gene hackman all rightfully deserved uh, and like I said, I didn't get it as a kid. I thought it was okay. But then, like I said, once it's really broken down and studied, uh, it is an incredible film. So my number three is is Unforgiven. Great film title. For, for sure. Yeah, it. Um, I, I definitely saw it in theater. Uh, I remember, you know, my grandpa talking about it. He he was in. A, hey, you had been like 15. 
he he wasn't a big fan of it um kind of uh, he thought it was a little like crass or whatever but also he didn't like the the idea of that like the the death of the of the the western right he like i said he likes the traditional story of western and oh. this is kind of the breaking down and breaking down the the mythos that's like the, the biggest Western, thing. Right? That's it's what like, it gets applauded for. Is that yeah, and it, and then, and it's great, and it is a hundred percent great for that. Uh, just I remember him saying that he, he didn't like that. Like, and the best scene, of course, and the best scene, the Schofield kid through the whole film is is this young kid full of piss and vinegar. I'm going to be the baddest outlaw. Yeah. I'm going to partner with uh, William Money, and we're going to take over the West. I'm going to get him. I'm going to kill a ton of people because I killed a ton of people. Then you found mm -hmm. out he never killed anybody. And yeah. then when the time comes and he has to kill somebody, he doesn't want to do it. Yeah. So it just adds and puts over Clint's character because he's warning him that it takes a lot to kill somebody. And you can go watch Josie Wales where he kills like 50 people. And yeah. you're like, this is fun. John Wayne kills a ton of people in that regard too. But what does all that mean and do to a person is yeah. totally do like dove into head first in Unforgiven. And for that, watching it with a more critical eye is why I appreciate it the third, fourth time I had seen it. For sure. Uh, Unforgiven. I was talking to my dad the other day and I told him what we were doing and he said, well, you know what's going to be on your list. And, I, and then I told him my list and he's like, no, not that one. No, not that one. No, not that one. <laughs> Unforgiven. I was like, yeah, but that's not my list. I'm sure it's going to show up. I know. And I almost and did. I'm, and I know he's happy it shows up here early in the show. Because yeah. they run pretty long. He's like, oh, there it is. Now I can turn it, it off. <laughs> no, and it, it wasn't. But I listened to a ton of Western podcasts and everyone had it one. Everyone had one. There's a ton of Clint Eastwood stuff. The big picture just did three guys did their top five Clint in honor of Cry Macho. Unforgiven on all three of them. And I'm like, what am I missing? And I went back and then I did the Cinephiles episode. And I was like, God, this movie deserves to be talked about. It is an incredible film for that reason. And again, Gene Hackman is phenomenal in this film. So, mm -hmm. okay. Maybe what you got for two. All right. Uh, my number two, we're you know, talked about a movie where um, somebody, a lot of people get killed. A lot of people get killed in this movie. Uh, it is the 1969 oh, yeah. Sam Peckinpah, The Wild Bunch. Sure. Uh, and so this movie uh, came, basically, um, this movie has been called uh, The Death of the Western um, because uh, it's um, basically was exactly what you're just talking about for Unforgiven, where uh, there are no good guys. There are no bad guys in here. There is no white hat. The idea of the white hat, uh, black hat uh, is non-existent here. Uh, and you're, you don't really know who you're rooting for because uh, you, they set it up at the beginning where you know, William Holden, who plays Pike, uh, leads this group of you know uh, bandits, but you don't really know they're bandits because they're all dressed as soldiers uh, into town, and they're there to rob a bank. But little do they know, uh, Robert Ryan, who plays Thornton, who is Pike's old buddy uh, and partner, uh, is there with a group of bounty hunters to set up this trap to get them. Uh, and so the uh, the gang is got uh, Ernest Borgnine, who's uh, um, Pike's right hand man, which is Dutch, and then you have the Gorsh brothers, uh, one uh, who are played by uh, Ben Johnson and uh, my man Warren Oates. I love, I love me some Warren Oates. Mm -hmm. He he rules in pretty much everything he shows up in, and he's no exception here. He, he's one of the Gorsh brothers who are a couple of badasses. Uh, and then you know, there's, there's another, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, you know minor characters. There's uh, Angel who comes up later on. Uh, but uh, so you get in and you you don't find out you don't know who you're rooting for you don't know who you, uh, are the good guys and bad guys until stuff st starts happening and once the shootout starts happening it is pure chaos and I, I was listening to a thing today that talked about uh, the average shot uh, time in that whole opening sequence which is, which is I think about 15 minutes uh, is one second per or one second per shot so that's the, how many edits so there's like 300 edits in like the Michael first Bay 10 style. minutes. Yeah, it, it is horrible. And, which which is which is insane for 1969. It was it was never it was not a thing that uh, it would happen. And it is pure chaos when you watch it. Uh, there's you know guys mid fall falling off of roofs, like people uh, civilians getting shot, and then, like and that's the thing with this thing is that 
uh, with the wild bunch is there are buckets and buckets of blood in this uh, i forget how many <laughs> squibs were used for this movie but it is like people in in 69 when they went to see it where i guess were like running for the exits like ready to puke because there's so much blood in this which when you watch it now is laughable for, compared to our standards but at the time people were not ready for it um but it, it it's uh it's it's a fantastic film that again you know blurs the lines right you start rooting for pike uh and his guys because they're being chased by these despicable uh bounty hunters but the bounty hunters are the law they're, they're followed by the law they've been commissioned to go after these guys and they're supposed to be the you know the quote-unquote good guys uh one of the uh main bounty hunters is our buddy strother martin who keeps <laughs> popping up for us uh popped up in slap shot that we all went to see the other night and uh you know he you know he's been in a bunch of different movies that we talk about but uh strother martin he plays <laughs> this real scumbag him and this his buddy tc they're fighting through the whole thing and they're they <clears throat> They basically once they kill people they they're like vultures and they come in and start like looting them and like looting the bodies and taking their boots and taking all their stuff off of them and they're like oh i want this and fighting over the thing i shot that guy no you shot that guy and uh you know that's where some of the kind of humor comes into it but at the same time it's kind of like whoa like this these are the law and they're you know there's scumbags uh where you have the, the also the guys from the wild bunch who um, you, you start to like because they're, you know, re really great characters, uh, really well-written characters, and you start rooting for them. Uh, they they kind of, you know, take in with the, uh, the Mexican army, and uh, there's a whole big plot point with that that I won't get into, but that is kind of their downfall as well. And so uh, what I love about it is it not only has been called the death of the Western, in the movie itself, uh, the, the thing is that these guys and they're they're all older. These are, these are all older actors at the time. William Holden's you know you know up there in age, and same with Robert Ryan. They're kind of you know uh, you know in the later part of their years. And so the movie itself is about these guys coming to terms with that the landscape is changing. Uh, they can't go on keep doing the things that they've been doing because things are not the wild west anymore you know things are starting to become civilized uh there's the um the, the women's with the fresh um suffragette movement is has started in the movie so it's you know you can start to see that it's starting to become modern times where these guys are a thing of the past and they realize it so they're kind of like they know that their days are numbered as far and not just in you know being gunned down but they're they can't keep carrying on like they they were and so they you see them kind of realize that through as the movie goes on and you know kind of like okay well, this is going to be a, a last hurrah for us um and and you know uh as this the film has uh been known for it has uh one of the most insane uh endings uh to a movie where it is the last 20 minutes are this insane gunfight uh, between the wild bunch and the, the basically the entire Mexican army, uh, and you know William Holden's on you got the iconic of him on the the machine gun, gunning gunning guys down, uh, and it is it is insane. And so one of the things that on the, that I noticed on this last rewatch that I just watched, you know, probably a few weeks ago, uh, is there's no music playing in that final scene for the whole twenty minutes and telling your battle scene. There's no score. There's no score. All you hear is the the sounds of the battle, the 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 machine gun, you know, the the random the gunshots. So zero music. It's like dead silent as far as the music goes. So there's no you know thing. It's just you all you're hearing is the battle and like guys dying and guys getting shot and it's yeah, like I was, I was just like it never it just struck me on that viewing. I was like man, like it's so weird to have a thing like this big climax of a movie. And there's no score going on. There's nothing, you know, there's no like heroic music. There's no, you know, tense music to drive the thing. It does, doesn't need it. The, the scene is insane enough on its own. But it is, I just thought that was kind of neat that, you know, it kind of let the scene, you know, give the, its own emotions without the help of music. But anyway, um, yeah, they'll never they'll never make them like Sam Peckinpah because they're not allowed to. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's a it's one of the all time 
uh, craziest westerns you'll watch, uh, and it's an, it's an entertaining. I think it's two and a half hours. It's it flies by because it is is super entertaining. Um, so yeah, night number two, Wild Bunch. I've only seen part of that movie. There was the time when I was um, when I after I watched the documentary <clears throat> of uh, Easy Riders Raging Bulls, which is and uh, Sam Peck and Paul is uh, uh, a subject of that documentary, and they go through his, quickly through his uh, some of his filmography. And I was making a checklist of some of those movies to watch, and that obviously Wild Bunch was on it. Um, and then I caught, and then it was on TV, and I was like, "Oh, okay, let's start this." I only caught a a little bit before I had to run out the door. I own it though, and I was just trying to look for it. I rearranged my DVDs uh, recently, so it must be behind the green screen. But that's so you, definitely the one I'll have to watch. So you, you do like a double feature with that in After Hours, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, might, they might be next to each other. Actually, <laughs> Movies Matt has said he's going to watch. and I could, do, I could do an hour-long show of the movies I own and have not watched yet. <laughs> I buy them because I need them to fill gaps in like certain filmographies of uh, directors and uh, writers and stars and stuff. Well, yeah, if you have not watched Wild Bunch, please, please do yourself a favor. I guarantee you'll enjoy it because it is impossible not to enjoy if you like movies of this ilk. There's zero boring parts in it. Okay. My number two is another uh, Western that's not quite a Western. And... <laughs> Part of one of my favorite franchises of all time. Oh, wow. Back called, to the you Future. This one, but you called this one as Part, one. No, I didn't. I said this would be three. Oh, did, oh Back okay. Back to the Future. Okay. Yeah. Part three. So I'm, yeah. Um, and similar to how Fifa Goes West was the first Western I've ever, I ever saw, this must be the second one. And tells a story. It's the third part of the trilogy. Uh, it uh, starts off right where the second one ends, where... Uh, Marty is in 1955. He's just spent, uh, he's just finished the second movie of adventures. He's, uh, he comes across the 55 counterpart of doc Brown. He's, they have that excellent scene where I'm back. I'm back from the future. Doc faints. And we're into the third movie where he has to help. He's tasked to help Marty, uh, go back to 1985 doc in the second movie has been struck by lightning and, a letter comes through time uh, the long way around as uh, some time traveling uh, films would call it. And it's discovered that doc Brown is in the old West is in uh, 1855. No, 18, 1885. He's in 1885. Mm -hmm. And uh, throughout some of their research, they discover that doc Brown will eventually die days after he's written that letter. So instead of going to 1985, Marty says, I'm going to, 1885 to bring you home. Uh, they, he successfully gets into uh, uh, tra travels back in time to 1885. He finds his pal Doc and he thinks, all right, now let's go home. There's a cut in the gas line. Uh, so they can't start the car. Uh, they try uh, they try boozing the car. The they uh, head over to the bartender says, this is the strongest stuff I have. They throw that in there. The transmission comes flying out because of how strong the alcohol is. Uh, they come up with a plan that they're going to hijack a train and push the DeLorean to the required 18, eight, to the required 88 miles an hour and go uh, back to the future. Uh, in the meantime, Doc Brown falls in love with uh, Mary Steenburgen. Uh, and... Uh, that complicates things because he wants to stay or he wants to bring her with them. Um, now the back to the future trilogy is probably, I don't know where to put it in terms of uh, favorite franchise or even favorite trilogy of films, because for a long time you would say, well, star Wars is my favorite trilogy of films. There's 12 movies in star Wars. Now it's not a trilogy anymore. So I would probably put Back to the Future as my favorite trilogy of films. And a lot of people would, there's arguments on like which order people have their favorites in. And many polls recently have been, I like three better than two. And it's under, 
<laughs> AB's in the minority on that one. Yeah. But uh, but you can uh, you certainly can argue for it. It's a completely different ki- type of movie as far as the other two are concerned, mm-hmm. and it uh, brings Doc Brown's character f- more into the uh, foreground. The first two movies obviously star Marty McFly. This one, you would argue, stars Christopher Lloyd. It's funny. They have the switch of the catchphrases, too. That's right. Yeah. So it's fun. Yeah. No, and it's like a fun parody. Like, I was looking at the history of the Westerns, and obviously the Western is king. Apex Mountain Western, 50s and 60s. 25% of films are all Westerns. And then the 70s, they kind of become popular, but they're cliche themselves, and Clint's pretty much got the bag on it. But in the 80s, it was kind of cliche and corny. So, you know, the late 80s and early 90s ones you get are kind of like parodies of it. And that's kind of what Back to the Future 3 is. It's a self-aware parody of the Western by doing a Western by winking and nodding at other Westerns. And that's and that, like the fun of it. And you would say, and uh, you could say, uh, Unforgiven brought the well, yeah, know, panache dances, back dances, to that's it. That's what everybody says on everything is Dances with Wolves and Unforgiven in, in uh, you know, two years apart. Well, uh, I, I'd say it's it starts before and any kind of like it kind of like MTV eyes it, but 80, 88 was Young Guns, right? Well, we'll so, get that's what I'm yeah. saying. Those, those so ones you have are 80, all... 80, 88 Young has Young Guns, and but I think it's serious. You're saying it's kind of a parody of itself. I think it's kind of serious. It's kind of like jokey. like a MT, MTV. Uh, well, they have you know, Bon Jovi on the soundtrack. Yeah, that's well, that's Bon Jovi's in the yeah yeah, and in, in, uh, does the uh, theme song in the, for the second one blaze of glory is in is in the young guns too uh but um uh yeah it it, it i i'm like i think it's you know you can kind of think of it as western light but it, it was pretty serious and it's a pretty big deal anyway we might get to it later but what maybe, we'll see. <laughs> well yeah back to future three that's guy I knew it would be on your list it's great that's a fun it's a fun western there's a lot of callbacks to other westerns and it's great I, I remember seeing two in the theater and had the to be continued and, and had but the then to be concluded. concluded. Or, that's right. To be concluded. And it, it came up, they showed scenes from the third one and yeah, I you got the trailer right away, right away. And so I remember going, what wild West, like what? And so, you know, at the same time, I, I definitely was excited for it. And, you know, it, it, it's, I, I don't like it as much as two, but I still love it. I love all three. <laughs> I think all three are fantastic. So it, it definitely is a fun way to kind of wrap things up. And it also, also a way of kind of ending it, which I was happy about too. Yeah. That, you know, like it, it, when they spoiler alert for anyone who has never seen back to the future three shame on you, but uh, that, you know, the DeLorean gets destroyed. Uh, you know, they, they make their own thing with the train or whatever, but the DeLorean's destroyed. It kind of like, that's it. It's, it's the end. The Dorian's gone, uh, and it kind of wraps it up nicely, which is great. And just quickly, two things about the trilogy. Uh, first, uh, Back to the Future Three is not one of them. Is not the one I would put on first, or like, oh, I want to watch this one today. It's it's one, two, then three. I could watch one on its own. I could watch two on its own, but I have to watch the first two before I watch three. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. And the other, and the other thing is Thomas F. Wilson is an absolute star throughout <laughs> the trilogy because he plays like 17 different versions of the tan and family family yeah. members. And in Buford, three yeah, is Buford. his best performance. Yeah, Buford, Mad dog Tannen is amazing. Yeah. So that was my number two. I cool. agree. His Trump, his Trump is the best performance. His <laughs> Trump, Trump is better, but yes. Uh, so number two, it's going to be a modern Western guys. It's going to be one that I remember seeing in theaters. I remember being, just out of college and seeing it and being like, oh my God, Westerns are sick. Like this movie blew my mind. So as soon as we said the Western list, I really want to put a lot of work to get three in my honorable mentions, but I knew my one and two were going to be. And for a moment, I thought I was going to put this at one when I rewatched it again uh, for fun last year. And then again, I put it on the background when I was just working on a puzzle, just because of how much I love this film. Uh, It is a perfect, it is a perfect Film in the sense that it's what I like about films. It's a two-hander. Big name versus big name with a third name who steals the entire film. And I'm talking about 2007's 310 to Yuma remake. So in this movie, Russell Crowe plays Ben Wade, a ruthless outlaw with his gang. And his gang is seconded by Ben Foster. 
Ben Foster being the one who steals this entire yeah. film, guys. Ben Foster has carte blanche with me based off this and Alpha Dog in, I think, the same year or the year Alpha Dog before. Don't like that movie. Foster rules in that, though. Mm -hmm. And then Russell Crowe in this, he plays a, a one-legged, disabled um, war veteran turned rancher named uh, named Dan. And uh, Dan uh, felt kind of embarrassed. He's got a, he's kind of the laughing stock of the area he's in. And uh, because he was sent home, he wasn't quite a, a war hero uh, in his mind. So what he has to do in this is uh, get Russell Crowe's Ben Wade on the train to the 310 to the Yuma prison. And in doing so... He has his men and and Russell Crowe in an absolute charismatic, like charming leading man performance. And, and there's another movie that comes in later about uh, glorifying well, a few movies, actually, that I have on my list. It's kind of a theme glorifying the villain. And in this, Logan Lerman plays Bale's son, is obsessed with Christian Bale or with uh, Russell Crowe as a character. He's heard the fables. He's heard the tales. He thinks he's the coolest. He thinks the outlaw is the hero and that's what you get with a lot of westerns where the black hat is the cool one and oh my god this guy gets in shootouts and this guy drinks whiskey and, and all that stuff so what i love about it is they get in you know as they go through and they're getting to the uh getting to the train station uh there's some great conversation between the two men and they have more in common than they expected and you know it's kind of that story that if there were different circumstances for each, they might be in different positions than they were. And there's a mutual respect that's grown uh, between the two men for, for that reason and, and through that. And ultimately at the end, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, again, we'll go with the spoiler alert. No one's going to care. But <laughs> Russell Crowe does get on the train to the 310 to Yuma, but he does it willingly because he has respect for Christian Bale's character. And he knows what it means that this is, you know, ultimately a suicide mission because Ben Foster is orchestrating his uh, his release. But he wants to go. And then there's a sly little admission that he's already broken out of the Yuma prison twice already. So what does it matter? I'll go back. You got me on the train to go to the prison. I'll just break it a third time. That's not on you, but you got me there. And the movie ultimately ends with him calling his horse to ride alongside. And you're just like, man, I love Crow in this movie, but that's, that's the thing you shouldn't. He's a, he's a vicious outlaw, but ultimately he does turn. And, uh, and for that reason, but James Mangold, obviously he goes on, there's a little bit of Western and everything he did. He did Logan, which was a, you know, a Neo Western of, of <laughs> sorts, but he always has that really gritty feel to, uh, to a few of his films. Uh, and uh, and this is the first time I had heard of him. And like I said, the cast of this uh, is incredible and incredible performance all throughout. So there are quite a few remakes and a few that will show up later on my uh, on my list. But I will always have a soft spot for the 310 to Yuma remake from 2007. And it's because of 310 to Yuma and Logan, which makes me very excited that James Mangold will be directing is currently directing and the Indiana fifth Jones Indiana, Indiana Jones movie. Five. Sure. Yeah. yeah. He's a big oh, name. He, I mean, he just did Ford vs Ferrari. Yeah, I was just gonna say, there's that, <laughs> and the, uh, there's um, was it Lost City of Z Zid? Is that his? No, that wasn't his. There's there's Kate one. Leopold uh, is his. Okay, there's there's <laughs> there's a few there's a few that like I you look at his filmography and and, and it's solid. He's he's not I, one of the first names that comes to mind when you think about big name directors, but he's made it solid. Oh, he walked the lines. Walked the yeah. line the year yeah, before, uh, two years before that. And then lately, uh, his last three have been Wolverine, Logan, Ford vs. Ferrari, and then Indiana Jones 5. Why well, he's the game. Yeah. yeah, he is. And he's been around for oh, a long Copland time. Too. Well, yes, Copland, that was it. And Girl yeah. Interrupted. Those yeah. were two movies where yeah. I didn't know he was attached in. Because, like, I think it was Walk the Line where I, is the first time I heard his name. And sure. since then, followed his filmography a little bit. So to realize he did great movies before that, I was like, wow, this guy's been around for a while. Yeah. Crow, yeah. like that's like I said, Crow rules in this movie. He makes a very likable, charming villain. And that's the important thing about the old West. That's why we love the villains that we do for that reason. We'll get to that later. Okay. And, uh, and like I said, Bale being a very sympathetic character with his family and, you know, absolute heat check performances across the board. I think Ben Foster as Charlie is one of the all time heat checks. He's sure. incredible in this film and yeah. he's been incredible in a lot of films and never nominated for an Oscar for it. Uh, the thing. He, if this he movie always, comes out 10 years later, he's a billion percent nominated for an Oscar. He he always, he, it's it's funny because he always plays that secondary oh. character and he, that that's where his, he shines, right? Ben Foster he, is the I don't most think valuable off the bench guy. 
Yeah, I don't think he can lead a movie on his own, but he comes in and has that, that he checks. You're absolutely right. He is the absolute Uh, dynamo for that. So that's the thing. He he always pops up. Uh, He popped up in a modern one that Helen Highwater, and he plays the other brother to Chris Pine. And uh, he's unbelievable in that as well so it's the command she's uh, seen in that is yeah electric, oh gosh, guys amazing uh so yeah i, I saw 310 to Yuma in theaters with mike actually and we that. were both we were both raving about it afterwards uh i remember i remember the experience much. i saw it and i remember i came home and i got into westerns for a little bit and i remember matt yeah. asking me and i that's when i watched a few others that i hadn't seen at that time and uh yeah, that was probably one of my first conduits to being an adult and going back to watch for us. <laughs> Good. Oh, I was like, I was 20, so yeah. All right. Uh, these are, no, wait, so we're going to move on to our honorable, honorable mentions. mentions. Honorable mentions. Uh, these right. are going to be our honorable mentions. Um, so uh, I'm going to use this time to uh, shout out movies that my grandfather would very much approve of uh in as far as old westerns there are two big directors that <laughs> are keep coming up in a lot of lists uh as as the two big two to watch a lot of their movies and that's john ford and howard hawks and so you, you can be in one camp or the other uh i mean you can like both of them but it, it seems that you know you can favor one or the other i prefer one over the other for sure but the one i prefer l- least but i don't i that doesn't discount his movies because i love his movies is john ford so i picked number uh 1962's uh the man who shot Liberty i just watched Balanced. it too it is fantastic it's wow. got john wayne uh Jam- jimmy stewart Perfect and my Andrew. man lee marvin as the uh, title character, Libby Valance, and he is a bad, bad man. I love Lee Marvin in this. Uh, he is worth the watch just for this. Lee, just Lee got Marvin. greenlit as a. I think they're bringing it back as a show. I, but that's. I just watched it and found out a little bit. Like a, of, like bringing a it back. Extent, like I think a limited so. Limited show. A limited I think series. So. Oh, good. I wouldn't want it to be a show that carries on, but it would, yeah, it would maybe they're good. remaking. They're remaking it as a film, or I think a nice. show. But I looked into that this week. Okay, and so my uh, my so obviously I like Howard Hawks better. Uh, Howard Hawks uh, kind of you know takes on a little darker movies for me. Um, and the reason why you know I, I kind of gravitated to Howard Hawks early on was because I found out my <laughs> favorite director, John Carpenter was a big Howard Hawks fan. And so the reason I found out that out is uh, that um basically precinct 13 and as well as ghosts of mars are kind of an homage to this movie from 1959 which is rio bravo again starring john wayne you got dean martin in an amazing performance uh as well as a young ricky nelson uh and so uh this is a very cool kind of hangout movie and they end up uh um uh, you know, kind of, you know, getting to know each other, hanging out, waiting for these guys to come and attack the town. Uh, and so they're kind of defending the town, uh, the small group of people against, you know, a, a great number of people. And uh, it, it's it's a fantastic film. Uh, <laughs> you know, again, uh, great performances by everybody. Uh, the standout for me is Dean Martin as the town drunk turned uh, hero uh, who stands with uh john wayne so yeah real problem uh okay my honorable mentions include the one on my list that would follow the uh traditional traditional sense of a western the man with no name trilogy that's i'm cheating because i want to put all three movies on there (laughs) fistful of dollars for a few dollars more and the good the bad and the ugly for the record i will say here on record for a few dollars more is the best of the three uh, by far uh you've got uh you've got clint te- teaming up with lee van cleef uh which is way better than them going head to head the two of them together and kind of doing the buddy buddy uh bounty hunter thing in the second one is the best so that's i'm just putting that on record i won't disagree with you but i've watched the good and the bad and the ugly more times sure because it's a day long so it's good to have on yeah. and then clean the house. Yeah. And then you come back anytime you're, you know, well, it's playing. It's like, oh, this is a good scene. And then you go back to clean the kitchen. Oh, that's and then the, come back. Oh, this is a good scene. That's the thing is the like, and, and it's, you know, it's like two and a half, almost three hours long. Uh, and there's like, there's these great scenes, but in between those scenes, there's like 
really slow stuff. There's a lot and of walking through the desert. A lot of walking through the deserts, and I'm just like, all right, Leone, kind of you know, chop this up and <laughs> make, give us a little tight two hour uh, jaunt here. And that's uh, which before, is what I think he gives us in the second one. Well, and that's before the extended cut, which is what <laughs> yeah. I put on the blue, extended Blu ray yeah. cut of The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And then we and, go back to. Oh, oh, I was going to say one more thing on there. Uh, one thing that uh, it should you know should always be brought up when this is a, when this one is brought up is Ennio Marconi, who gives us the score here, which is iconic. Yeah, which is really what, iconic. When, when you think of westerns, you think, yeah, which is from this thing. So, like, we, that's one of the things that is the king of this this trilogy is Marconi. Uh, with that amazing music that yeah that and i was listening on legendary. waiting for you ecstasy of gold there you go which i first heard from jay-z and then we go back to the comedy westerns maverick oh, yes sir oh, I, I knew yeah it's been on ab's list before that's yep. funny yeah this Love that it. we i like compiled my list like just around the time it was around the time richard donner had passed away yep. so i added on there because i thought we were we intended to record around then so I could, we could honor him that way at least. Yep. Um, so now with no name trilogy and Maverick, my honorable mention. Ma- Maverick's so great just because it, it, you know, it, it talks about what we talked about earlier <laughs> with the kind of parodies it up and kind of, you know, it has all the, you know, throwback uh, uh, cameos by all the old time Western guys in it. Yeah. It's, it's just fun. It is such a fun film. So hey, that's awesome. Okay, All I right. a few I'm gonna do. Uh, gosh, I like I said, I want. I, thank God you guys had some older ones. I watched a ton of older ones. Uh, I wanted to put them on there, but like I said, I just have better relationships with some of the more modern ones, and I think they chug along a little better. So my three are gonna be uh, the True Grit remake. Yeah, because I'm an outlaw. I got three. <laughs> uh, the True Grit remake uh, from 2010, directed by the Coen Brothers. I saw this movie in theaters twice. Uh, I will, for my money, think the Haley Steinfeld performance is probably one of the best debuts in film history. Her going opposite Academy Award winner Jeff Bridges and absolutely undressing him in almost every scene he's in uh, is unbelievable. This cast is great. This movie's great. It's uh, I remember it got a lot of awards, fodder for it. And I was thinking, oh, the Westerns are full all the way back. Uh, and uh, I love the True Grit remake. Uh, another film that... Um, reason i have three is because the last two kind of tied uh so we're gonna go first with the assassination of jesse james by the coward robert ford you want to talk about a movie that's a day long this movie's like three hours and ten minutes took me like three days to watch it uh the main thing i think that i take away from it the most is charismatic brad pitt as jesse james and uh uh how he has his band of outlaws and you know played by jeremy renner and joined by casey affleck and sam rockwell and a few other who's who paul paul schneider and some guys that you might recognize from other things are are in that group and uh just beautifully shot i mean every everyone will tell you deacons 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 Deacon's the first thing it's true this is probably one of the first movies that i remember sorting out through his filmography and he really uh he really shoots the hell out of the scenic and terrain and stuff like that and like i said to uh this goes back to the 310 to yuma argument and you know the idea of idolizing people and you know romancing the legend of an outlaw and the effect that has on somebody and Casey Affleck obviously overcome by jealousy because he wants he's in love with Jesse James and he wants to be Jesse James and he thinks by killing Jesse James he will become Jesse James and that's not what happens Uh, and if you can make it to the three hour mark when it it finally happens, then more power to you. And guys, I couldn't leave it out. I I just, I love, (laughs) I love the Magnificent Seven remake. This is one of my, this is one of my favorite remakes. This movie is so fun. Chris Pratt plays Faraday is literally what I would have been if I was a cowboy. Guys, this movie has my favorite movie quote ever. We got a day and a half. It's a, we got, it's a day and a half trip back to Junction City. We got two days. Let's do a half day of drinking. So for that, that's Magnificent Seven, uh, Assassination of Jesse James, and True Grit are my three honorable mentions. Denzel's a cowboy. That's awesome. <laughs> Denzel is a cowboy. That kicks so much ass. The trailer. Oh, the House of the Rising Sun remix. I watch that trailer all the time. I love the Magnificent right, Seven remake. Are right, you guys had he had four and you had four and you had three uh on there so I feel inadequate. 
I am going to throw Once Upon a Time uh, in in the Once Upon a Time in the West in there uh, from uh, the other other film from Sergio Leone, uh, which is even longer than Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, but it is uh, it is unbelievable. Uh, big cast in that. Uh, it, it's fantastic. So I will throw that one in there just to. Because I feel really jealous. Uh, all right, we're gonna get to our number one. So my number one is one I discovered courtesy of Mr. Quentin Tarantino, uh, who when, talked about it when uh, Hateful Eight came out, uh, and this is one of the inspirations for that from one of the other uh, leaders in uh, a t- a, the Spaghetti Western. And I, I'm a big fan of the Spaghetti Western. My grandpa hated them uh, again because they were counter to uh the traditional western you had a lot of the bad guys as the leads whereas you know in the the the, uh leone movies it was always the bad bad bounty bounty hunters that were uh the leads in that and uh and this one is also bounty hunters this is from another sergio but this is from sergio carbucci uh who did the uh movie django which was an inspiration for for django uh uh Quentin's Quentin's mirroring Django, and this is uh, The Great Silence from 1968, uh, starring Klaus Kinski and John Louis Tringen. Uh, And so, which also features music from Marconi. Music in this is a little bit different from uh, the the, uh, Man with No Name trilogy, in that Marconi does it's a little bit more. uh, almost like horror or chilling kind of mu- music and it's like a it's great score but it's doesn't have those same kind of themes like the the you know adventurous um tr- like you know very upbeat themes these are very um downbeat themes in this one and it's really great because this one is this one turns everything on its head the uh the great silence uh first of all is a snowbound western which is you know how it's um uh a, a um how Quentin, you know, got on it. Uh, Quentin loves snowbound westerns. Apparently, uh, he, I heard him talk about it on a podcast when uh, Hateful Eight came out. So he started listing off a bunch of them. This was one of them. This is one that he was raving about. So I instantly watched it and fell in love with it. And this movie, uh, it's called The Great Silence because the main character has been named Silence because he has been he is mute. He's he had his throat slit. Uh, as a young man and uh so he is mute and so they call him silence and so he is uh known throughout the land as being a deadly gunfighter he doesn't just kill guys sometimes he kills guys sometimes he is so good that he will shoot the thumbs off of guys uh so that they can no longer fire a gun and so his big thing is that he is going around and killing bounty hunters so all the bounty hunters are scared uh, shitless of him because he is going around uh, not just killing guys. He's like I said, he's killing some of them, but other guys he's he's taking away their livelihood, shooting their thumbs off so they can't shoot guns anymore. Uh, and so uh, everybody, like I said, everyone's he's got this legend that follows him, uh, and p- people know him thing. And so this woman hires him uh, and, and, and to avenge her husband's death and her husband was killed by one of the bounty hunters which is played by klaus kinski and if you've seen klaus kinski and things you know how crazy he is in real life and in movies he always plays this crazy character in this he plays loco uh which is in the english dub version i think in the the actual version the real version is togera uh, which is like means little tiger and or or it is loco in the english one which is crazy so either way it suits him because he's he is crazy or he is this you know ferocious little tiger that kind of you know um goes after his prey uh and so he close kinski loves his job a little too much he uh got into the bounty hunting game because he very much enjoys murdering people and so um again just like i uh had with uh, earlier ones you have all these bounty hunters who are uh, according to the law the leather of the law they are the good guys they are doing the the work of the law uh 
and you have uh you know silence who's going around he is also killing people doing it justly right he's always he always makes sure that it's a just killing uh but he is doing it for revenge and he's out to, for revenge and you find out why i won't spoil why because it is a big deal in the movie uh why he's going after these bounty hunters and why he's getting his for revenge and so he takes this job from this woman who uh is played in you know in 1968 by a black woman which was pretty crazy for the times and so she has a relationship with silence uh but she also is wanted by the money man from the town uh who it uh you know he he's kind of orchestrating these bounty hunters who are going after the outlaws who are in the hills and one of the things that's great about this movie is that the outlaws in the hills are just people that have been blackballed by this rich businessman in town and who can't get supplies anymore and so they're basically starving to death in, in the mountains and they are robbing people just to eat, just to survive. And so the bounty hunters are out to get them. And they're, you know, the good guys. But the, really, they're, you know, killing people that are just robbing to to live. Uh, and so you have this, again, evil businessman. And there's a showdown between uh, that. And you find out there's, there's a little more to him that, than you anticipated. And that's a great reveal, too. Uh, it, it's It's just a fantastically beautiful movie. Again, you know, there's... The shots of you know silence uh, riding his horse through the the snow uh, covered plains, uh, you know, and it's it's just it's an incredibly beautiful film, uh, but it's also very violent, very bloody, um, and it's got one of the um, more controversial endings in in all of westerns. Um, people were not ready for the ending of this film and I will not give it away, but uh, it is definitely not a traditional ending. Um, and it, it, it gives a, a different vibe. It is a very nihilistic movie. And so it, I kind of, I'm kind of giving hints away at that, but it is, it is about uh, as bleak as you can get. I love it for that is, is it just kind of, you know, takes that whole, um, the whole thing of uh, the traditional Western and kind of even the spaghetti Westerns, it kind of flips it all on its head and goes complete opposite. And then for that, it's definitely by number one. Say the title one more time. The great, the great silence. silence. Uh, It is, it is available to watch for free on canopy. Uh, If you have canopy, the app, uh, or you can, it's on Roku. Uh, You can watch it on there for free. I watch it on there. I also have the Blu-ray, but I it was just as easy to watch it on canopy. Uh but uh let A B know you want to see it and he'll mail out his Blu-ray. Right, cool. <laughs> I will you will not. I will mail you a link to Canopy so you can watch it for free on there. But uh it looks great on Canopy. Canopy, if you don't know, check it out. It's free through your library card and it's got amazing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. criterion stuff on there. Uh all kinds of great, 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 great movies and all in HD. So check out Canopy, check out great great silence all awesome. right my number one is what is it scott see young guns no it's not young oh, guns okay. <laughs> i finished two, I finished two, two three. three i have no idea that. i don't know Go no up. my say two uh, stone. my number one uh follows the uh pattern of my list previous it's a western with Mixed with another genre okay. is probably one of the funniest movies of all time. Oh, Blazing okay. Yay. Saddles. Okay. All right. I'm with it. <laughs> a Mel another, Brooks another one. classic. Yeah. Another one that they don't make them like they used to. Yeah. They, no, I mean, no, they would never in a million years get made today. I mean, it, no, but I would disagree. I mean, it wouldn't be made the same way it was. Sure. I think it sure. could be remade because it's, it, it's a comedy. And as long oh, as like, fantastic. you know, um, they would uh, keep the uh, tone to a present day, vernacular it could definitely be done again um i was uh i think it was last no it had would have been like two years ago i was at uh dr disc which is one of our local uh new and used uh uh music and video stores i was up in their dvd section and uh a kid came by kid he was probably 21 (laughs) yeah he's a kid with uh i'm assuming was his girlfriend and they uh, he wanted to uh impress her with all of his movie knowledge as they walked around the uh, room together and they pick, he picked up blazing saddles and he was like, and he said to her, 
this is a very funny movie, but it is so racist. <laughs> and I, w- I wanted to like shake them or just call them <laughs> wrong because yes, race is obviously a part of it. Yeah. The story is about a black sheriff in a town of people of white people in the old West. I mean, uh, slavery, it looked like slavery had ended like two days before. <laughs> and now they're all endangered <laughs> servants instead. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, it's, I mean, to go through the story, uh, Clavon Little plays uh, Black Bart, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, he's. Uh, I'm sure he was a former slave, current indentured servant, um, who uh, is <laughs> uh, him and his uh, him and his coworker or friend are sent up the rails to uh, the end of the line on a push cart, and they fall into quicksand. Um. <laughs> And uh, some of the uh, uh, overseers come by and <laughs> they're so concerned about, they're like, get a rope. Hurry, we got get this out of here. They're talking about the push cart. So they pull that out because that's their livelihood. Clavon Little and his buddy are crawling out. And uh, the overseers are saying, all right, guys, break's over. Get back to work. And he's had enough of it. He picks up a shovel wax a guy and he's sent to jail for that and he's sent to be hanged in the meantime uh harvey corman is a he's not the governor mel brooks plays the governor harvey corman plays some uh like local, real estate tycoon yeah he he wants to buy rock ridge yeah uh rock ridge is uh sent a telegram saying we've there's trouble afoot we need a sheriff and uh he uh suspends uh black bart's uh death sentence for I just want to say when guy. he goes, my favorite part of the whole movie is when he sticks his head out and tells him that that's who he needs. Yeah. And you behind him, it the guy with the hanging, it's the guy and the horse both have nooses around their neck. It's my yeah. favorite part. <laughs> the horse has a noose around his neck. It's the best part of the movie. It kills me every time. Um, so they send Black Bart to be the new sheriff of Rock Ridge because they won't accept him. He's not going to change the town, and we're going to get to take it over anyways. Um, he comes to town. Uh, they obviously don't accept him right away. Uh, he has Gene Wilder in a jail cell for drunkenness. He uh, uh, he sobers up, uh, brings him out. He becomes his deputy. So now we have a black sheriff and the Jewish deputy running the town of Rock Ridge. Controversy abound and uh, to the point of, oh, this doesn't happen, of course. Um, um, and they eventually come up with a plan to save the town. First, uh, they're like, how many screenwriters are in this movie? There's like seven credited screenwriters. And one of them was uh, Richard Pryor. And Mel Brooks has said over and over again, we are so happy to have Richard Pryor uh, as a screenwriter because that got us uh, the permission to use the N-word a lot. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. Lot. A, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, which was funny because Richard Pryor didn't write, I mean, any if – at all of the movie he wrote the mongo parts sure who was this big idiot guy who they send into a town to take care of black bart and things go uh uh faulty that way the whole movie start to finish is a laugh riot it kind of loses me at the near the end of the third act when the fourth wall gets broken mm. and the uh, the western movie breaks into the musical film and then they start uh fighting all, all over like the back studio lot yeah. And Harvey Corman uh, uh, flees to a movie theater to watch the end of the movie he's in, and a uh, Black Bart shows up on a horse. <laughs> That's my favorite part is when Harvey Corman is sitting in the movie theater. He's watching the movie happen. He sees on screen Black Bart is approaching, and he spits out his raisinets. He's like, "Oh <laughs> shit!" <laughs> um, but other than uh, other than the little snippet of like. Uh, where Dom DeLuise plays uh, a director directing a musical and they crash his set, the movie is 100%. For me, just a perfect comedy and happens to be a Western, so it gets on this list. Nice. Oh, I like it. I rewatched it recently as well, too. It's great. I uh, am very influential on the Lil Nas X Old Town Road music <laughs> video. I thought that too, because when he comes into town, he's got the Gucci bag. And then well, yes. X, of course, has the line, uh, Cowboy Hat from Gucci, Wrangler on my booty. And I, it's, you can't help but make the comparisons. 
Okay, I'll get out of here, guys. My number one. Um, what I love. I uh, what do I love about movies? I love. I love movie stars i love stars i love i love charming movie stars doing charming things and there is no more rewatchable film in my repertoire than the two most charming movie stars of this yeah. earning generation uh being incredibly charming it is one of my most rewatched films uh, i have ever seen it's in my uh top 10 to 15 area uh, of it but uh switch casting the sundance kid from 1969 directed by george roy hill uh, and in it, it's Paul Newman uh, plays Butch Cassidy and Robert Redford playing the Sundance Kid. And it's written from a, a very famous script by uh, William Goldman. I have William Goldman's Adventures of the Screen Trade right here, which comes with an actual uh, printed replica of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. So you better believe I recently watched that on the weekend and followed along in uh, in that book uh as well too. Uh, also, one of my favorite shirts that these guys know I have uh, is adorned <laughs> with the faces of Newman and Redford as a Butch and Sundance. Uh, one of the most famous films. It's it's not always loved by Western aficionados. I can't imagine that uh, your grandfather or RM would be uh, big big fans of this movie because it's they kind do, of they. a what's that. They actually, I think my grandfather did like this. It's he, a send up yeah. to the idea of the uh, the westerns in the fact that yeah. it's very modern sensibilities in a western setting, and mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot of and a lot of the things you see too is the one thing that makes Butch Cassidy and his kid uh, is they're running away from the danger, or they're fleeing, and mm -hmm. obviously this is in an era where John Wayne fought and went out and killed and all this, and whereas uh, you know there's some monumental lines that's again the most famous one of the most famous scripts ever written uh and there's lines the fall is going to kill you small price to play for beauty uh i got vision the rest of the world wears bifocals things like that and another one too is when you find out that uh that sundance has uh or butch has never fired a gun and Sundance hell of a time to tell me now and yeah, yeah. uh and they had never actually uh fired and killed anybody before which again ties back to that unforgiving kind of thing uh it's a send up to the idea of a uh a western and it's more meta than anything and um and like i said it's it's one of the movies i've i've seen it's definitely the western i've seen the most because i've seen this movie at least a dozen times and uh that's to say it's probably one of my most watched films in the last few years like i'll put it on especially that's on disney plus i think in the last two years i've had disney plus i must have watched it at least five times uh and uh, it's just a lovely film and they had done two together they did this thing uh shortly after this and uh these are two of the most famous people of all time being famous and being charming and, and and owning and hamming it up for the screen and uh and ultimately when you get to the third act in bolivia and they tell themselves they're not gonna to uh rob any more banks but they partner up with struther martin morons i've got <laughs> morons on my team <laughs> and uh i know it's funny I, <laughs> I forgot he had that heat check performance in the movie for yeah. like three minutes and uh and then they go and slowly bad habits rear their head and they become bank robbers again. Because that's what Butch Cassidy and some of those kids were. They were bank robbers and they keep telling themselves it's the last job, it's the last job, it's the last job. They're going to go straight, they're going to go straight. And slowly you know that they're not going to. So uh, at the end, they get in a big, big, big shootout. A famous ending as well too. Did you see LaForge there? Who's the guy that's hunting him? No. Oh good, I thought we were in real trouble. And then they run out into an ambush of bullets as the screen freeze frames. And... Uh, when you dive into it, it's a very polarizing ending. I'm sure it must have been at the time, you know, uh, when people were looking for a definitive answer for the film. I think it provides that. But when you watch it, it's one of the most beautiful endings as well, too. And it's got really fun musical montages as well that are kind of very old timey, you know, four minute montages. Raindrops keep falling on my head, which I didn't get it at the time. I knew it was like when it was lampooned in Spider-Man 2, I knew it was from Butch and Sundance. I didn't understand it at the time, though, when I watched it the first time. But it's one of the great, you know, throwbacks to a film like that, that you would have a four minute montage of, you know, Paul Newman and Catherine Ross riding a bicycle. And it's awesome. It's so rewatchable. And that's like my main thing about this film. So that's why it's my number one is, is Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. So I knew that that would be my one. And everything else would be more modern. So at least I got <laughs> something from 1969 on here, the golden days of the Western. So my number one, Butch and Sundance. Cool. Well, that does it for our list. And I can hear everyone <laughs> at home saying, well, they forgot and they missed. And why yeah. isn't on their list? Why isn't, on there? why isn't the searchers on there? Because why isn't, it, the, why isn't the original it. true? Is great. It, why isn't it? Okay. I'm surprised. Tombstone the third act, I was like, what movie yeah. is this? 
Um, I think the, I think the biggest I think I the vow. biggest I think the biggest one that uh, people are going to be like was oh no Tombstone, uh, and you know I love I love me some Tombstone. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, again, it's Kurt being incredible, uh, but there I don't love all of Tombstone. You know you've got all the stuff with with Kurt and Val. Anytime Val Kilmer's on the screen, I'm I'm all in. Uh, and you know there's the stuff all the stuff with Kurt, but then you know the whole romance stuff when it gets into the romance stuff there's a ton of behind the scenes stuff on that film too i know i know take over the directing chair it's good i just watched it for the first time last year and was blown away listening to the rewatchables on it it, i'd never seen it so i mean it again like so it's a tale of two movies like i think they if they had you know edited out a ton of that other stuff well that's the thing if you uh, were that quiet earth that's the movie and then you that's they're the two movies that split so it it uh, it doesn't make my list stupid based on that. When I watch every time I watch I watch it, I don't fully enjoy it because I'm like, oh, like if they just got rid of all this stuff and just kept to the this other stuff, it would be far more enjoyable. But anyway, yeah, I wanted to get more into John Wayne. I think if anything, this is, I'm gonna take away. I'm gonna take a break from westerns because I've watched a lot, <laughs> yeah, watched yeah, a, yeah. Lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> I, but I'm, I'm gonna not... go back and I'm gonna watch Shane. I'm gonna watch a few of those movies that I had. I've never watched the original True Grit for what for which he won. The Academy Good. Award for, which again was probably a reward. He probably deserved it for the searchers, is from what I can gather. But uh, there's a lot of John Wayne that I didn't. But I also watched Liberty Valance recently too, and that's. I'm. That's uh, I, I gotta nice. say, I gotta say, I'm not. I'm not a huge John Wayne fan. RM is probably the biggest John Wayne fan that, that I know. But I, I'm not. I I will. I yeah. I'm not a huge John Wayne fan. I'm, I'm always a fan of his of the secondary characters in his movies. Uh, like I said, Dean Martin in Rio Bravo and uh, Lee Marvin steals the movie for Man Who Shot Liberty Balance. But uh, I will say uh, one of my favorite of uh, uh, John Wayne movies, and you can check it out, it's called The Shootist. And it's one of his last pictures. Uh, basically, he knows that he's going to die at this point uh, in real life. And uh, it's kind of his you know, goodbye to the western and goodbye to you know moments to the world uh and it's about a, a an old gunfighter uh who's kind of like at the end of his line and it it's it's a powerful movie i i watched it again it was on this was a while i watched it was a, like maybe a couple years ago and um um when my blanket on him uh the it, i listen to the podcast i listen to pure pure cinema um gremlins joe dante john joe dante is on there and joe dante is a massive western fan and he gave a list of movies that he watched and he recommended the shootest and i was i had never even heard of it and so i checked it out and he was right like it it kind of again it kind of takes the mythos of john wayne and kind of flips it because he's you know this old well and that's and that's where of, we are even uh, today with crime macho in theaters that's, that's yeah, uh, oh, yeah that's 91. so if uh you know we don't i mean clint's gonna be in the director's chair next year <laughs> like <laughs> Clint, clint's probably gonna he's direct gonna, iron, gonna uh, gonna iron man four so he, he's like gonna, he's gonna die in the no director's kidding chair, and uh and he'll still get everyone out in time for lunch but uh yeah. that's the main thing you can go dive into the the history of crime macho too and he plays an aging uh I'm a uh, um, bull rider. So it's yeah. the same kind of thing, you know, when they look back on the career on that. Okay, Matt, are you taking us home or are we drafting? Um, I think we're going to take, well, uh, Jersey it's just Jim is three of us. The... No, just three of us. Uh, well, since you've mentioned drafts, we'll tell everybody to head over to the Mac Flash Entertainment Facebook page where you can see the draft results where uh, several times uh, throughout the month, uh, myself, AB, uh, Scott, Francois, Jersey Jim, a couple of others. We uh, uh, set up a topic and then draft what we think are the best uh, songs or movies. And then you go on to the Facebook page and vote on which list you like the best. Um, So we have a couple in the can. Head over there and you'll see all of the drafts and you can do your voting and whatnot there. But for this video i want to thank everybody for watching don't forget to like share subscribe put your list of your favorite westerns in the comments there are so many we did not have and that you love let us know all about them so for scott for ab my name is matt and we will see you down the road reach for the sky